<clears throat> Hello, my name is Philip Tennant. I'm with Data Theorem, and today I'm going to be telling you about what's new and what's changing in iOS 12 as far as app security goes. So to give a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about, uh, Firstly, we're going to be talking about the ways that iOS makes it easy for your users to create and to manage secure credentials via the autofill system. Additionally, we'll talk about the NS Secure Coding Protocol and how it protects your app from object substitution attacks. We'll go over how you want as many connections and resources as possible within your app to be served over secure web connections. And lastly, we'll go over some of the API level changes coming with iOS 12. So, iOS 12 introduces the ability for iOS to almost automatically detect when your app is presenting a sign up or a sign in flow, and it will prompt the user with a secure, automatically generated password or allow the user to autofill their save credentials via biometrics like Touch ID or Face ID, depending on the context. Additionally, these passwords are synced across the user's iCloud account, so autofill is available on all of their devices. Um, so this feature of iOS enables the user to never have to think about passwords at all. Uh, their passwords are generated by the system, synced across the user's devices, and auto-filled with two-factor via biometrics. So in essence, the user's password becomes an implementation detail that they no longer need to consciously worry about, uh, which is a huge win for security. So as we know, people tend to reuse their passwords or use passwords which might be uh, insecure but easy to remember. Uh, so by removing as much friction as possible from the process of creating and managing secure credentials, you vastly increase the effective security of your users if they opt into this system. Okay, so now I have a demo of what this autofill system actually looks like in action. Um, so I have an app here demonstrating a sign-up flow, a sign-in flow, and a two-factor authentication code flow. Uh, so let's say I'm a new user. I want to create an account for your service. Um, so I type in my username and I go to the password field to create a password. Uh, and you can see iOS immediately prompts me with an automatically generated secure password. So I can deny this if I want, but clearly the default option is to go with the credentials that the system suggests. Uh, so I'll do so, create my account. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I've created my account. I wanna sign in and you can see Right when I go to type in my username, iOS prompts me with my saved credentials in the quick type bar. When I select it, authenticates me via Face ID and autofills my username and password. Um, so I've now signed in. Uh, let's, lastly, let's say my service requires two-factor authentication. So traditionally, this requires the user to jump back and forth between messages in your app, memorizing the code and entering it. Uh, with iOS 12, the system just handles all of this automatically. Uh, so it saw that I'm in a two-factor authentication code context, and in the background, it's been scanning and parsing my incoming messages for a two-factor code. Uh, so when I get to the two-factor auth code field, I can just autofill it directly from the quick type bar. Okay, so how do we actually use this in our apps? Uh, so to hint to iOS about where your username and password entry fields are, you simply have to set the text content type property to one of these provided constants, uh, UI text content type username, password, or new password for account creation. Um, likewise, to enable autofill of two-factor SMS codes, it's the exact same idea. You just set the text content type of your two-factor auth input field to UI text content type one-time code. Um, so iOS does actually have some heuristics to try to detect when your app is in a sign up or a sign in flow if you don't explicitly set these. Uh, but Apple says that the autofill functionality will be faster and more reliable in all types of UI flows if you hint to the system in this way uh, about your fields. Um, additionally, for this functionality to be enabled, you must have associated domains uh, set up with your app and you can check out the Apple docs for the specifics of, of how to set that up if you haven't already. Um, okay, so now we're gonna move on to the concept of securely and safely serializing and deserializing data within your app. So serialization and deserialization are the process of saving and restoring some code objects somewhere other than RAM, respectively. Um, so this can be used, for example, if you want to restore some state to run your app later or to pass information across con uh, against process boundaries. 
Um, so there are lots of contexts in which you might want to do something like this. Um, and since the process of deserialization actually results in creating an object which can cause code to be run, uh, you have to be extremely careful in terms of security to ensure an attacker can't execute code. Um, so let's say we have some object stored in a serialized format. Let's take a look at what the code would look like to turn this back into an object we can actually use again. So if you're using the NS coding protocol to store and retrieve your objects, this is the typical idiom that you would use to decode an object. Um, so as you can see here, firstly, we decode the object from the stored version, and then immediately on the line afterwards, we check that it's the type of object that we wanted, and if not, we stop and we, we say something went wrong. Um, so in fact, there is a security vulnerability in this code, uh, which using NS coding at all with this pattern uh, leaves you vulnerable to. So the issue actually happens during the call to decode the object. In the process of deserializing the object, it invokes the object's initializer, which would lead directly to remote code execution if some maliciously malicious serialized data has been constructed correctly. Um, so the issue here is that the decoding operation and the validation operation are not performed atomically. That is, other actions can happen before you have a chance to verify the decoded object and error out. Uh, additionally, even if this were not the case, this pattern requires the programmer to remember to validate the object after decoding, uh, which is really not ideal. Preferably, we want there to be as little room for programmer error as possible. Uh, and for things to always happen in a safe way. So the solution to this vulnerability uh, is to use the NS secure coding protocol instead of NS coding. NS secure coding has a contract with the programmer that deserialization and validation will be performed in a single atomic step. Uh, so with this approach, there's no risk of programmer error of forgetting to validate the object and even better, it's impossible for a maliciously crafted object to execute code before you have a chance to catch it in the act. Um, so once again, the issue with NS coding is that you just have this opaque payload and the critical flaw is that once you interact with it at all, you're already compromised. To contrast, when you use NS secure coding, uh, you're guaranteed that you will either receive what you expected uh, or an error will be raised, which can be safely handled. So again, NS coding is vulnerable to object substitution attacks. Uh, so the, the critical flaw with NS coding is that the deserialized object has been used before it's been validated. Uh, and this attack is actually well known and it's an issue in other environments as well. Uh, for example, Python's pickle module is vulnerable to this exact same type of attack. So, I'll quickly go over the nitty gritty of what you actually have to do to transition to NS secure coding within your app if you're currently serializing with NS coding. Uh, so the first step is, of course, to change your class to conform from NS coding to NS secure coding. Uh, so here I have a dummy class, which is serializable. Um, so the first step is to define this class method, support secure coding, uh, and have it return a value of yes. Um, and actually, if you don't override the init with coder initializer, that's all you have to do. You're done. Um, of course, if you do override init with coder, you have a little bit more work. Um, so you can see in this initializer here, uh, when I decode the object, I call this method decode object of class for key. So I specify the expected class right in the deserialize operation. Uh, this is as opposed to uh, a call you might already be using, which is decode object for key. Um, so lastly, NS keyed, archive, NS keyed archivers init initializer is deprecated. Uh, you should call init requiring secure coding, passing a value of yes. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to the topic of making secure network connections within your app. Um, so the goal is to eventually have 100% of the network connections within your app to be made over HTTPS. Um, but the most unsafe thing is to have uh, the flag NS allow arbitrary load set to yes. Uh, this is a flag that allows any connection made from your app to be made over HTTP. Uh, this is a huge red flag. And if you have this in your app, you should be aiming to set this to no as soon as you can. Uh, 
Using this flag leaves your app vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks, to data theft, to an attacker phishing your user with fake pages, uh, and more. Um, it is okay to have a few specific HTTP domains which you have exemptions for, uh, but this whitelist should really be as small as possible, and you should definitely not be allowing all connections to be made over HTTP. Um, eventually, Apple is actually going to start blocking apps that enable this flag, uh, so you should make the necessary changes to be able to set this to no as soon as possible. Apple originally said that any app with this flag after a deadline they announced of January 2017 would be rejected from the App Store. Uh, they did later cancel this, but this year at WWDC, we were told um, that Apple was reaching out to some small groups of apps to either justify or change their app transport security exemptions. Um, so they're starting more and more to crack down on this. Uh, also introduced in iOS 12 is this new network framework. Uh, so this framework provides a modern interface for interacting at a lower level with network protocols. Um, so instead of accessing lower level network APIs like BSD sockets, secure transport, or CF network directly, uh, you should go through this framework instead. Um, so when you want to embed a web view within your application, typically the class UI web view has been used to do this. Uh, a few years ago, Apple introduced a more modern alternative, WK WebView, which is a lot better in terms of both security and performance. Uh, as of iOS 12, UI WebView has been officially deprecated, uh, and you should migrate to using WK WebView. Um, WK WebView provides better security than UI WebView by running out of process from your app. Um, so WebKit, the engine that UI WebView and WK WebView uses to render pages, uh, has a huge attack surface like any browser engine does, uh, and new zero days within WebKit are being released or exploited all the time. Um, so by running WebKit in an isolated process, your app can't be compromised even if WebKit is. Um, so since there's no chance of the app being able to interact with the WK WebView process's address space, it's safe for, for WebKit to do just-in-time JavaScript compilation, which is a, which is a huge win for performance and actually about doubles uh, load and render speeds. WK WebView also supports rendering thousands more web objects uh, in a single page than UI WebView does and supports some features that UI WebView doesn't like index DB and array buffer. Um, so here's an example of the speed comparison between UI WebView and WK WebView. We, was, we visited wire.com. Um, UI WebView took about six seconds. Uh, WK WebView took less than half of that to load and render the same page. Um, so w WK WebView is way better in terms of both performance and security. Uh, so you really can't go wrong. Um, and WK WebView was first introduced in iOS 8. So the Swift standard library now includes a new random number generator API. Uh, so the problem that's being solved here is that existing APIs to generate random numbers, such as RAND or ARC4 random, are vulnerable to prediction or aren't cryptographically secure. So an attacker can uh, potentially predict what random numbers your app is going to generate, which can enable some pretty nasty things depending on what your app does with RNG. Um, so this is the new interface. You can call random on the types that support this, uh, optionally providing a range if it makes sense for the object type. Uh, you can check out the Swift proposal for all the specifics on, on this API. Uh, so to summarize, the autofill system in iOS 12 makes it really easy for your users to create and manage secure credentials. Um, you should migrate to NS Secure Coding if you perform any sort of serial, serialization uh, to prevent against an entire class of deserialization attacks. Um, your app transport security exemptions uh, should be minimal or none at all. Um, you should enforce HTTPS everywhere or your app will eventually be rejected from the App Store. Uh, and lastly, UI WebView is deprecated, it's slow, uh, and it leaves your app vulnerable to WebKit exploits, uh, and you should upgrade to WK WebView. So to sum it all up, security is hard, data theorem makes it easy. We have an analyzer engine which specifically looks for unsafe or outdated practices. Uh, and in fact, every pattern mentioned in this, in this presentation is caught by our engine. Um, so if you'd like to find out more, definitely check out our research blog 
uh, or our website. Um, and that's all. Thanks for listening.